feminist movement that arose in the 1940s and advocated for victory abroad, but also at home, where basic freedoms were denied to African Americans. Pippin carefully constructs this painting to embody the hypo hypocrisy, which is the promise of freedom in America. The African American and white soldiers are wearing the same outfits in contradiction to the inequality implied the by the division of the two groups. The large V, a symbol for victory, dominates the composition, but a fracture in its base shows that the, how the man standing on its center and wielding a hammer, the same Mr. Prejudice of the title, is about to fracture this victory. Um, next slide. Pippin includes himself in this painting on the lower left side in a uniform. We can identify him by his wounded arm, which hangs limply at his side. He too fought and sacrificed for his country, but many years later is using the same wounded arm to fight for freedom in another way, through his art. I would now like to turn to my colleague Kalima, who will lay out the rest of the exhibition. Thank you, Annalena. Um, you can go to the next slide, Bianca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Mr. Prejudice painting is the focus of the uh, Horace Pippin Racism and War exhibit. Um, the other works which are part of this exhibition include an illustrated journal which belonged to Pippin during his time fighting in World War I. Uh, also, World Wars I and II propaganda posters and photographs documenting the Double V campaign of the 1940s. Um, during both wars, there was a lot of propaganda to encourage African Americans to join the war effort. Next slide. There's no non-awkward way to say that. Um, here on this first slide, you can see a World War I poster with President Abraham Lincoln on it. In the poster, African-American soldiers are fighting German soldiers and the poster is titled, True Sons of Freedom. The poster shows African-American soldiers as victorious in the fight against the Germans. And the title suggests that if black citizens were to fight in the war, they would become true sons or rightful citizens of America, the land of the free. Next slide. Um, this next image on this slide is of a World War II poster. It shows one white man and one black man working in a factory with the words, United We Win, in bold along the bottom. Uh, an important thing to note here is that though both a black and a white man are working together, the white man is situated just a little bit higher than the black man, which perhaps suggests that though they're working the same job, white men are still seen as superior to their African-American counterparts. Next slide. Um, in the case of both wars, propaganda posters aim to promote the participation of African-Americans by showing that taking part in the war effort as a, or it was a patriotic duty, one that could lead to equal status in the country, but this is not how things turned out. Next slide. Um, the remaining objects in the show are from the Double V campaign. Starting in World War II, the V for victory was a slogan used in propaganda to indicate victory over the Axis powers in the war. Next slide. Uh, along those lines, on this next slide, we see, uh, actually, we don't see, <laughs> there should be a double V button there. I'm um, not sure where that is. Um, but if uh, you could see the double V button um, that sort of symbolizes uh, during the Second World War, the double V cam campaign, which was started to indicate that there are two fights that America needs to win. The first victory being the war in Europe and the second victory being against inequality, injustice and segregation towards African Americans domestically in the uh, in the United States. Even though African Americans went to great lengths to actively participate in the war, yeah, there's the button right there. Um, uh, even though African Americans went to great lengths to actively participate in the war effort, they were still not treated as equal citizens. For example, in the American military, African American soldiers weren't allowed to fight with white soldiers. They were often segregated as if it were the Jim Crow South. Um, Horace Pippin, for instance, fought in an all-American infantry uh, unit known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, the photo on this slide of the girl was taken by Teeny Harris, a Pittsburgh photographer who chronicled the Double V campaign. Um, the woman in this image is labeled as the Double V girl, and glamorous women from around the country applied to be the weekly Double V girl in local Black newspapers, and this was to bring attention to the campaign. Uh, next slide. 
Um, these posters and photographs uh, situate the painting Mr. Prejudice that Anna Elena was just talking about within the larger context of African Americans' fight for equality and justice in the face of government promises that were never realized. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so about a month after the Horace Pippin exhibition opens next fall, the Trout Gallery will be opening a second exhibition that focuses on America's history of racial injustice. Um, this exhibition, Tracing Slavery, Moses Williams and Carol Walker, examines the use of the silhouette medium by Moses Williams, arguably the first African American artist of renown, and Carol Walker, a contemporary Black artist. For this overview, my colleague Kayla and I are going to focus on Walker's works in the exhibition, a series of 15 prints entitled Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated. Next slide. So in the series, Walker uses her signature stylized silhouettes layered on top of enlarged copies of illustrations from the widely circulated history book called Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War. Over hundreds of pages, the book presents an in-depth look at the war told through thousands of images of civilian experiences, soldier portraits, and physical sites and events deemed important to the outcome of the Civil War. Next slide. The authors note at the beginning of his book um, is meant to show the history as it occurred, um, sticking closely to fact and truth. However, this presentation of history only includes the history of white Americans. Next slide. It very clearly leaves out the story of the black experience during the Civil War, um, but Walker annotates the images from the book to insert these black stories back into the narrative. Next slide. Using historical accounts and her own imagination, Walker creates black characters to populate, dominate, and disrupt the original Harper's prints. The overarching theme throughout this series is the idea of rewriting a history that excluded the experiences of black Americans. Each image presents a different strategy of her disruption. Next slide. There are images that add black bodies to the setting as if they are a part of the original print. Like you see here, a black woman is running in the opposite direction of the crowd, seizing the moment to flee to freedom. Next slide. Um, and here, some of the silhouettes act in a reductive fashion and erase or hide aspects of history. Like in this print, Walker silhouette blocks the prisoners so that all eyes turn to the large silhouette of a black man that occupies the center of the composition. Next slide. Others shift the focus on an image towards details that have been, may have been anecdotal in their origin. Here, the double silhouette focuses the viewer's attention on the tiny detail of a young black boy helping the Confederates pack up. Um, employing these various techniques, Walker uses her recognizable character silhouettes to connect these moments from the past to the continuing, continuing legacy of slavery in present day America. Next slide. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'm just gonna start talking about this image um, and what it kind of personally made me feel when I saw it. Um, last night, I went to a protest held for Breonna Taylor. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, Brianna Taylor is the 26 year old woman who was unlawfully killed in her home in the middle of the night in Louisville. Um, her death shook the nation. It deeply traumatized black women and their families. And here we are six months later, um, reliving this pain through the decision of the Louisville jury to not charge any of the cops in this case with murder and to only charge um, cop Brett Hanickson with uh, wanton endangerment, which is the potential of harming somebody, um, even though he fatally harmed Breonna Taylor, uh, he is only being charged for potentially hurting another person. Um, 
I felt that the Louisville jury erased Breonna Taylor's death as mindlessly as Louisville police erased her existence. The erasure of black bodies, black identities, black stories, black realities is not new in America. Kara Walker explores this phenomenon of erasure so uniquely. After last night's protest, I want to talk about Walker's work, not strictly from an academic viewpoint, but from a personal one. This kind of viewpoint is one that I think most people bring to viewing her work. Um, in this piece uh, called uh, An Army Train from the Portfolio, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War, I think best embodies the suffering revealed this summer. An army train um, from, the, for, from the portfolio Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War shows Union soldiers in covered wagons on their way to retaliate against a Confederate occupation. There are two silhouettes that we can see right here. Um, the first silhouette is a childlike figure with stick-like arms and a straw hat, holding a hoe and a bucket placed outside the left side border of the original print, while another figure lies dead in the grass in the bottom right corner. In the first silhouette, I see a black child, naive and cooperative, willing to work and participate in a white world. I see this black child unknowingly walking into a war that will determine his freedom and the quality of his life. What will happen to this child as he moves through this war? Then we see the second figure on the other end, a grown man, dead and discarded. Rising up from his body in black smoke are the letters that read soul, so, so, and trail off with some more so, so's. To me, the two silhouettes represent one person. This is black life and death in white America. Kara Walker purposely creates images that are set in the antebellum South, but reveal what she calls the psychological pathologies of racism today. When I look at the silhouette, I see Breonna Taylor, like the first figure of the working child, Breonna Taylor worked as an emergency room technician. She worked for her society. The backdrop of her life is still the same war that we see in this image, a war between the Union and the Confederacy, those who acknowledge and commit to right, to right systemic racism and those who condone it. And as she moves through a war that determines her freedom, her life, in the end, she is left dead and discarded. Kara Walker tells a story in this piece, and to me, it's the story of too many black babies, black life and black death dictated by white power and oppression. And that is uh, the end. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much to Ana Elena, to Halima. Um, to Bethany and to Kayla for sharing those insights on the exhibits. Um, we really appreciate it and it, it provides a great foundation for us to begin our conversation um, with Professor Bergen and Philogene. Um, so just to start, I'd love to ask um, if, say, if you could sort of share with us, what is the historical role of Black participation um, in the U.S. military, particularly in the early 20th century? Sure, yes, and thank you very much to um, the students for all your work on that, that was great. Um, so the first thing to note, right, is that black soldiers, seamen, um, and other military service people are forever in the US military, right? There's never a military occupation or war that the US involves itself in where there are not black people there. Um, and there's a few things that really characterize their participation in the earlier part um, of, the 20, of the 20th century. Um, and the first is to note, right, that the US military is segregated as a matter of policy until the year 1948. Right, so for most of the US's military history, it is segregated as a, as a matter of policy. And that is a real wound for African-American folks in the first part of the, of the 20th century in particular. And one thing to remember there, right, is that that segregation is never just about separation, but that segregation is also about resources. It's also about training. It's about the quality of resources. And it's also about hierarchy, right? So as the students pointed out, um, African-American folks aren't allowed to to be at a higher rank over white people in the military until World War I, actually. 
So the U.S. has a whole lot of military engagements around the turn of the 20th century that uh, black soldiers and seamen participate in, but it's really in World War I that black men in particular decide to sort of distinguish themselves and take a kind of stronger stance against segregation and mistreatment in the military. And one of the things that really frustrates them is that there's this dominant racist idea within the U.S. military that black men shouldn't be on the front lines or in combat roles because the idea is that they'll be cowardly on the front lines. So during World War I, we see this really strong pushback against that idea. And Heather, if you wouldn't mind throwing up that first slide that I was asking about the World War I propaganda. Um, Absolutely. Bianca, do you want to allow me to share? Thank you. Um, so there's this real pushback both in black produced propaganda and other propaganda to sort of say, hey, that's not, that's not so. And in fact, we see this big push in lots of different ways to, to open up more and more military roles to African American folks. Um, and so when you see this, uh, this particular brand of propaganda from World War I, it's really pushing back on the idea that African American men shouldn't be in combat roles because they would be lazy or cowardly on the front lines, right? Um, and indeed, part of what happens in World War I is that African American men do really, really well. Uh, so Horace Pippin, who's involved with the Harlem Hellfighters, the most famous African American regiment of World War I, um, is part of a whole unit that gets sided with, and my French is terrible, um, but it gets sided with a Croix de Guerre, and Jerry, maybe you can um, help me with that if that pronunciation is wrong. It sounds fine. Thank you. Uh, but this really important French recognition, recognition from France that they fought with valor and they fought really well. 171 men in the Harlem Hellfighters won that individually, but then the whole unit itself, including Horace Pippen then, would have won that kind of award. Um, black women are also involved, I should say, in World War I. They tend to serve as nurses and aid in other ways, often with the YMCA and the YWCA as it's doing work abroad. Um, but they really come in to uh, participate even more as do black men during World War II. So of course in World War II, we're still seeing segregated units, uh, but the numbers of black men in roles as well as black women are much, much larger. So there's about a million African-American folks serving either as draftees or volunteers in the armed forces, all of them in segregated units um, in World War II, and that includes just over about 6,000 African-American women who are in the Women's uh, Auxiliary Corps during the war. Thank you, Say, for setting up, I think, that historical context. I think that's really helpful, um, in part because, you know, this World War I imagery is very much emphasizing the fierce loyalty of African Americans to the United States and to different symbols of democracy and patriotism. But then Mr. Prejudice comes along and it seems to really kind of up in that image. I'm wondering, um, and, and we might start with you, Professor Philogene, how does the painting's images and textures convey this dissent? What is it about the painting that, that sort of challenges what might be interpreted as kind of these propagandistic images about Blacks in the military? Great. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, first, I'd like to thank the students for the wonderful presentation that you all made. In fact, I just thought that I, I don't really have to say anything about any, any of the images because you guys did such a wonderful job. But I think that, I mean, in addition to what they were saying, I mean, I think that the, uh, the composition is, is one thing. If we think about the, comp the composition, there is a certain way in which the composition, and I'm looking at the image in front of here, is just so incredibly tight. It's incredibly tight. So in that way, it kind of conveys the tensions and the kind of discontent that exists for Pippin and other uh, service uh, individuals when they come back from the war. But of course, we have this kind of looming presence of this individual, this white individual with a um, with a hammer and over, over that individual, we have clouds, these kind of menacing clouds. So the entire the entire piece, entire painting is really, is I think one about um, the possibility of destruction, but also the kind of discontent. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for putting it up. 
thank you, the kind of discontent that exists. And also you have the, the, the two ways in which the, 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 the image is framed. So on one side, you have a kind of all white uh, service individuals, industrial workers, and you have a white man holding a noose. And opposite, next, you know, the opposite end, you have black service workers and industrial workers, and you have this kind of brown, um, brown uh, image of the Statue of Liberty. So in all of this, it is, I think, really speaking to the kind of sense of discontent, the, the kind of damaging effects of racism, and the kind of damaging effects of segregation in particular, and segregation that, um, you know, contributed to the to, to ways that service individuals thought by fighting the wars, by fighting in the wars, they were going to come back to a space that allowed them and gave them freedom. But yet what they found was um, additional segregation, additional racism, and eventually to, for many deaths. So I think the, the, his uh, uh, Mr. Prejudice, who we assume, we presume is the gentleman, the white gentleman with the hammer, you know, is, is Mr. Prejudice. He basically is kind of putting an a, a ax, driving a wedge, in not only the double V campaign, but also making sure that the segregation maintains, stays in fact, uh, part of American culture. Thank you for that really trenchant analysis. Um, because the double V imagery looms so large, I'm wondering, you know, were there controversies um, toward the painting when it was first unveiled in 1943, um, were there controversies related to the double V campaign? Because it was obviously such a pervasive part um, of African-American life at the time. So I just, just kind of love to hear a little bit more about how, how did the public, and recognizing there are different publics, but how did the public respond to uh, the painting and the campaign in and of itself? Yeah. You know, I haven't come across any uh, material that um, that talks about the controversies of the painting. And I wonder, and I'm sure some of the students who probably have worked on this uh, more earlier, I mean, um, recently than I have, probably have come across any of that. But what I would say, um, perhaps, I was thinking perhaps less of a controversy is also Pippin's role as not one of the kind of uh, foremost well-known African-American artist, even though he was working at a time along the lines with uh, uh, Jacob Lawrence, who we all, uh, there's a lot of scholarship done on him and a lot of um, academic sources on him. They were working at the same time, but there's less of a, a kind of conversation about Pippin's work. And I think on some extent is one, he was um, disabled and, but also he was, um, uh, you know, he was he was disabled, but also he was um, someone who was a service person at, 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 as well. But he was also self-taught. He was also self-taught, unlike uh, Lawrence and some of the other people he was working with who had uh, gone through the academy, who had also studied, and themselves were teachers, themselves were in, engaged in the art community, whatever that was at the time for African Americans in the late, in the mid 1940s. So perhaps less of attention is placed on Mr. Prejudice because Horace Pippen himself, a lot of attention is not placed on him. So I, I don't know if the students have anything else they might, maybe they've come across material about that, but I have not come across anything about controversies to that image um, then. Who knows now though? Who knows now? Who knows now, right? Um. Yeah, and, 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 and say it looks like you were about to speak, so I don't want to interrupt you. Well, I also didn't want to like jump on some students' toes. Um, <laughs> so I think the other piece that's important there, and it's from today's perspective, it's really hard to imagine that there was a moment in US history where veterans weren't valorized, but that was absolutely true um, in the 1930s in the US in particular, which is of course some of the kind of immediate context for this. And that's because veterans marched on Washington during the Great Depression in order to demand that they get their um, veterans bonuses. Um, so they had been promised these veterans bonuses, particularly World War I soldiers. Um, and they kept being told to wait, to wait, to wait. But of course, the Great Depression comes along. Um, and 
hundreds of thousands of men march on Washington, many of them like camp out overnight in DC. And for some parts of the US, especially for some parts of the federal government, they become kind of this like, uh, annoyance, right? And so it's also perhaps partly Pippin's veteran status that's also making him kind of overlooked in, in some of these years as well. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful as well, contextually speaking. Um, before we transition to Walker, I wanted to sort of bring this home to the current moment because as I'm sure you're aware, we're living in such a politically divisive and inflamed moment. Um, so, you know, critics of contemporary Black protest movements often equate dissent with disloyalty. Mm -hmm. And white soldiers and veterans are often juxtaposed as the epitome of U.S. patriotism. I'm just, it, it, like Pippin's work really makes me wonder, where do we see images of Black patriotism today? And are these themes even relevant to contemporary Black life? Like, is showing a soldier, showing a veteran, is that telling a story that um, is useful um, for Black politics, Black life? So I'd just love to kind of get a sense of your interpretations of that in a contemporary sense. Mm -hmm. Did you? Well, um, I'll, I'll go say a few. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, I, I, I heard the question when I was looking at the question that you actually sent us. I was thinking about um, more about the, cr the critics of contemporary Black protest movements often, often equate that with dissent. And then I started thinking about that question, which I'm so happy you sent those early because that really allowed me to think, you know? Um, I, I, I started thinking and asking that to, to question, to ask questions about freedom, freedom and liberation and to protest is not, or not, I don't see them as disloyal acts. In fact, I see them as opposite. To even, um, because if you care so much about upholding democracy and you are very much invested in the idea of liberation and freedom, so to question those ideas are themselves, I think, acts of patriotism. Because you're really wanting to have conversations about what do those terms mean? How can I participate in those uh, conversations? How do I, as a, as a person of African descent, become part of that conversation? So I see to question them is not an act of dissent. It is actually, an, I see, an act of uh, patriotism. And also the fact that we continue to live, um, to love and fight for this country is itself, again, another act of black patriotism. So to question those things for me is not um, disloyal. Uh, what, what, what I think is problematic is how then it gets read as disloyal because we are investigating the ideals that we hold to be true. And it is in that investigation that individuals become suspect. But those who are questioning and investigating, that is an act of patriotism, you know, because you want to uphold the very virtues that supposedly bind us as Americans. And I think I would just add, I know you want to talk about the present, Vincent, but I'm really bad at that. But this is a really <laughs> old thing, right? This is a really, really old um, criticism of, uh, of Black freedom struggles to mm -hmm. say that Black freedom struggles aren't patriotic, that they hate America. And no matter what kind of language these freedom struggles tried to speak in, no matter how much they got behind a war effort, I mean, two and a half million Black men enlisted in the U.S. Army during World War II. Like, I just... You know, and so I think to kind of constantly be told you're not doing enough to show your love for the country is a real slap in the face. And I think that if we think about how angry some people get now, right, about athletic, uh, athletes um, protesting and stuff, mm -hmm. I think my wish is to sort of sit down and have a conversation about how long the protest has been going on, where it, it didn't look like it was directed straight at a flag. It looked like conversations. It looked like signing up for the military. It looks like all kinds of things. Um, and so there's a really long history of this. Well, I think both perspectives, I think, work together very well, right? Because we're really questioning how is reality being constructed? How is the discourse being constructed as well? Because they, they, they work in tandem. Um, 
I want to shift gears a bit to Walker because I want to make sure to dig into her work as well. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing um, several of the pieces at an exhibit at the Whitney many years ago, and it's just, it's very stunning when you're witnessing them in person, just the size and the, and the texture and the color. Um, so she inverts, you know, Harper's objective uh, history through using negative space and distortion. I, I just love to know a little bit more about what kind of themes, right, are these silhouettes concealing and revealing, and, and how does it, how how do, how do her choices help us understand what the Civil War is outside of this allegedly official record? So I just would love to get a sense of what is the work of her aesthetic choices doing to us. Mm -hmm. who, who is that addressed to? Oh, okay. Well, uh, say, do you want? Okay. Well, I think, um, I mean, I think that the fact that she uses a kind of 18th and 19th century um, art making process uh, to make these portraits, one reveals the power of representation, right? Reveals the power of representation, which is very much what's at the heart of her work, is um, the ways in which we can kind of control black imagery. So I think the, the power of representation is very much at her, her work. I think also she's taken uh, 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 what we can imagine as a very simple art pro practice. It's a very simple art practice and really inflect with it a very powerful, as a very powerful artistic style, a very powerful artistic style. And then placing it on top of a kind of well-known historical narrative that presents a particular type of history about the Civil War, um, you know, asks us to think about the real reason that the Civil War happened, you know, and we imagine, um, you know, we're told it's because, you know, the North and like the South, blah, blah, blah. But what we really know, what we know is the institution of slavery is what was at the heart of the battles and the war. And I think by placing these um, uh, grotesque and very um, visually, uh, uh, you know, uh, stark images, she asks us, oh, thank you, Heather. <laughs> thank you, Heather. She asks us to really believe the truth, to understand the truth of what, you know, put brother against brother is a language that they oftentimes want to use. So I think she's really placing the real reason, the main, one of the main reasons, I should say, one of the main reasons of the Civil War is because of the institution of, of enslavement and the various, um, states that were uh, you know at war so she she reveals that for us but by using a uh, you know a very kind of um a beautiful uh, a beautiful kind of aesthetic process and i think that is one of the smart things about her work it's visually inviting to some extent but at the same time when you get really up close and you see the image you're just kind of like oh my god what is that you know so that is the kind of discon um that is a kind of tension that exists in her work that I think has made her such a prominent, prominent um, contemporary artist. So I think the other thing that's really powerful thinking collectively about this particular exhibition of Walker's is how much it reminds us that the one of the largest wars to happen after the Civil War was the memory of the war itself and who got to tell it, right? Um, so one of the ways in which uh, Jim Crow segregation was brought into the South in the 1880s and 1890s was this rewriting of Civil War history, right? This sort of sense that it wasn't about slavery, that under enslavement, Black people were happy, um, that in the post, immediate post-Civil War years, there was a period of quote unquote Black rule that was corrupt and awful, right? Um, and so as a whole, I, one of the things that I think is really powerful is that Walker's kind of layering of the histories and her purposeful distortions that happen in these pieces really remind us and force us to confront this huge kind of war over memory um, that really has continued to take place ever since the, the end of the Civil War. Mm. Um, I'm sorry if I just can just say I really love what you just said uh, f um, say in terms of the memory of the war and who gets to write it and I think one of the things that um, I always 
I always understand when I see her work, it reminds me, is that enslavement, the particular institution of, of, of slavery, was in fact a debilitating uh, institution for, on both parts, not, not only Blacks, but of course more so Blacks since they were uh, enslaved and traumatized and, and, and that legacy continues, but also whites, the individuals who were slave holders, who were enslavers. I mean, that also had a particular kind of traumatic effect. In particular, I would think the white women who had to be part of watching their husbands, uh, you know, rape black women and being part of that. So I think th there are so, so many levels that Walker's work allows us to investigate not only the particular, the peculiar institution of enslavement, but also the effects that that had on individual living in, in the United States. So I think our work helps us think about all these things. Yeah, I mean, I think both of, both of what, both of your perspectives are, are insightful in part because I feel like you're, you're doing a wonderful job in terms of connecting the content and the form. I mean, I, you know, Jerry, when you mentioned the grotesque, right? Um, like when I've seen, and I know obviously she has a much wider range uh, of, of pieces using silhouettes, but there's a certain kind of humor, there's a certain kind of irony, there's a kind of darkness um, that I think adds another layer because, you know, I think sometimes protest artists perceive very earnestly, you know, it's very, very, very humble, very low key, very, oh, you know, just peace, love and unity. And this is much more over mm -hmm. and, and almost kind of funny. I mean, one of, one of the um, silhouettes um, sort of pokes fun at um, Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's not in this exhibit, but I remember seeing it in the Whitney and I said to a friend of mine who's white, I said, this is why black people have no nostalgia for Gone with the Wind. For many people, it's, oh, it's so romantic and scarlet and red. And I'm like, you do understand this is about trying to convince us to be nostalgic for being enslaved. Mm -hmm. What is empowering about that? Right. Um, so yeah, um, I, my, my, my sort of last question, and this gives us also a little bit of space for some questions. Um, so Pippin and, and Walker are, are obviously have reached this point where they're these prominent canonized artists who are really you know, capturing different aspects of Black US experiences. I'm just wondering, are there some notable, less familiar Black artists who are offering kind of parallel disruption to this kind of official conventional history um, that, that, that audiences should explore, right? That kind of push, push our understanding of what's out there. I can't wait to hear what you have to say, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Can we have some of the slides, please? Well, I, when, again, uh, Vince, when you asked me this question, I'm so glad you did um, a couple of days ago. I kind of put together uh, images of two artists who I think are really um, doing what you're, you just um, suggested, kind of uh, disruptions to official and con conventional history. And the first is um, uh, slide 21, I guess, yeah. The first, on the um, on one side, I guess would be my right, my left. I I, I don't I, I I'm I don't know these things. But anyway, um, oh, there's one the one slide uh, where is the work of Betty Sar. Both both images are the work of Betty Sar, who is an African American woman who's been working since the since the '60s. And the the piece with the gun is. Um, a piece called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. She does this in 1972-73, and it's a, basically a sculpture assemblage. And it is, as you could see, critiquing, one, the stereotype of Aunt Jemima, right? The stereotype of, of what we uh, uh, has been, been come to known as Aunt Jemima. But also you see elements of a kind of resistance to these stereotypes, resistance to those images. So you have the black power uh, uh, fist up, you have the gun in Aunt Jemima's hands, but you also have the broom that she's holding and the bottom of the box, this is a small little, box piece is um, um, uh, cotton balls to, of course, simulate cotton. So this piece, she is, in a way, making a kind of direct attack to the stereotype of Aunt Jemima and basically uh, Aunt Jemima seeking her liberation, you know, seeking her liberation. And on the other piece next to it, this piece she does in around 2015, it's called um, it is called the Liberated 25, 25 Mammies. And once again, she uses the image that she's been well known for, the iconic 
early piece we talked about. And this is this piece reminded when I saw this piece, I thought about when recently I think Quaker Oats decided not to um, use Aunt Jemima on its um, on its in its um, packaging, and it just reminded me of this piece. So I kind of pulled it up to see that actually Aunt Jemima now has been liberated. And thinking about, okay, Betty Sarr's role in that, right? I'm sure the Quaker Oats people saw her work. They're like, yeah, we got to do this. So she's someone who I've um, been thinking, um, been thinking, oh, 100 years too late. Got it, Vincent. Thank you. Yeah. Period. <laughs> she's someone who I've been thinking of. The other, arti the other artist who I, uh, I, I find absolutely fantastic is David Hammonds. Um, and this is a piece that Hammonds did in 1988. It's, um, it was a mural. It was a huge, huge mural. Uh, that was kind of a um, uh, part of a nonprofit project in DC. And it's Jesse Jackson in what we would call in quote, quote unquote, white face. It's called, How Do You Like Me Now? So it's Jesse Jackson um, as a white Jesse Jackson. And then Hammond saying to us, you know, would we like, ha would we like Jesse Jackson now because he's a, he's a white man? Um, given, of course, the kind of vileness that was happening uh, for Jackson when he was, um, you know, seeking a variety of different offices. So it speaks directly to the American electoral quandaries, but specifically it's racism, specifically it's racism. And we can think about what Hammond's work now, right? We can think about Hammond's work now, given that we have a black, um, uh, a black, a South Asian black woman running or <laughs> I'm saying running for vice president, but we, we can't, we don't know for sure. But anyway, so, and the last piece is, I'd all like to show you is another piece by Hammond. Um, and this is called Injustice Case. And he does this in 1970. And it's a body print of Hammond himself. He's the, uh, the figure there. But it is a piece that is um, uh, 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 mimicking, if you will, the case when Bobby Seale was uh, brought up for on charges in court. Seale was tied to the chair. He was gagged because, according to the judge, he was uh, disturbing the case because he would um, uh, uh, make uh, comments during uh, during the proceedings. So they had him tied to the chair throughout the entire case. Of course, the case was thrown out because of it violated his civil rights. And um, Hammond was very much uh, touched by that. So he produces a body print of himself tied in there. But surrounding it on the edge, as you see, are, is the American flag. So here, again, um, you know, Hammonds is making a direct commentary about the American political system, but also the American uh, judicial system and arguing, rightly so, considering what we saw yesterday with Breonna Taylor, that oftentimes, most times, Black people, Brown people, queer people, trans people do not get the justice when their bodies are violated and to some extent killed. So those are the two artists who um, some of you may know of them, but for me, whenever I teach a, you know, a black arts class, they're always in my class because their works are still today profound and still today can offer us so much. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, thank for you, sharing those, those works with us. <laughs> Um, so I think we have a few minutes left. So I, I think we're very happy uh, to provide opportunities if folks have questions for um, our wonderful, you know, the wonderful student staff members of the Trout, our wonderful commentators. So I think if you use the, I don't know, raise hand function or the reactions function, I think we'll be able to find you. So questions, questions. Yeah, hi. I was just um, wondering, maybe uh, Professor Bergen, you might know, uh, just like some contextual uh, history for what happened to the Double V campaign after World War II. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there were two really big Black-led campaigns during World War II. There was the original March on Washington movement, which was led by A. Philip Randolph, mm -hmm. sort of one of the most important trade unionists in the U.S. at the time. Um, and then there was the double V and what tended to happen was that these uh, 
these really overlapped and ended up kind of merging into particular sort of chapters. So a place like Detroit, which I know, love and study a lot, um, had a kind of March on Washington movement chapter and a double V chapter. They end up becoming kind of the same. Um, and they end up writing a lot um, during the early Cold War years, a lot of these groups, um, these sort of criticisms, it's, and it's interesting how much patriotism is part of our conversation today, right? These criticisms of how the U.S. can't really sort of fight for democracy abroad and say that it is against totalitarianism when there is still segregation at home. They end up pushing it really successfully to get President Truman to desegregate the military in 1948. We should note that he does that during an election year when he's particularly trying to sort of catch a lot of the black vote and stuff. Um, but then after the Kind of 1940s and the Cold War, um, when McCarthyism comes down, it, it tends to really clamp down on on these groups in particular. Great question. Good, thank you. We also have a question um, in the chat, um, and the question is: I have a hard time to understand Black soldiers' patriotism. What is a country for Black soldiers in that time? What does patriotism mean for them? I, I have a bit of an answer to this question. Someone else can add if I don't get everything. But um, to my understanding, at least from you know researching some of the objects in our exhibition right now, um, is that the 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 things that African American folks struggled with during these times were that they weren't seen as fully American. Um, for a long time when they were slaves, they weren't even seen as fully human, right? And then as you're getting to, you know, post reconstruction, civil rights movement, the things that they're struggling with is being seen as equal to their white counterparts. And so one of the things that was, you know, I, don't, I feel like the word tempting is the wrong word to use here, but one of the things that, you know, encouraged African Americans to participate in the war effort was, hey, look at this really patriotic duty that you can do in order to obtain that equal status of, you know, white people in the country. Um, and I think that there were some empty promises made, especially in the propaganda posters that, you know, we started talking about. There were some empty promises made in terms of, oh, if you fight in the war, um, that'll help you gain this status in the country. But of course, after these wars ended, we all saw that that wasn't actually the case. They weren't actually seen as equal to um, white Americans. Um, someone else can add something to that, but that's just what I was thinking. Okay. Yes, well, there's there's definitely a lot there. Um, we are approaching the twilight um, for this mm -hmm. program. Um, so I just want to express my gratitude to Bianca and to Heather Flaherty for um, their wonderful support and collaboration. Thank you very much uh, to Ana Elena, to Bethany, to Halima, to Gala for um, your insightful perspectives. And of course, professors Bergen and Philogene. Um, I mean, I could, talk to you all night about this. There's just so much there. Um, but the good news is that in the fall of 2021, good. the exhibits will be at the Trout Gallery. Good. So there will be an opportunity to really spend more time with them, yeah. you know, up close and personal and to dig in. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. Um, so we hope that folks will continue to support the Trout Gallery, the Trout Gallery's programs. Um, the Popolo Shaw Center is, is always, you know, happy to I work with the gallery um, and to support the arts because the arts have so much to say to us, obviously, um, about US history and issues related to social justice and diversity. So thank you for spending this time with us and we hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.